G'day, Money Miters. Welcome back. How are we, boys? Doing well. How are you going, Stroy? What brings you to the the table today, Stroy? Well, I'm lucky enough to be introducing Sam Berridge for our interview today. Uh, He's from Perennial, and we're talking great stuff. (laughs) Oh, we are talking good stuff today. We've got (laughs) uranium. We've got macro. We've got (laughs) mining companies. It's all the things you'd want to hear on the show. They're on brand things. To, yeah. To so talk about. all I'm saying is tune in, get focused, <laughs> sit down. In get <laughs> what, did, what did you think of the interview, Struth? Special. <laughs> it was a special interview. You don't get interviews like it every day. What was your favourite part? Well, what I want to know from you guys is what was your favourite part? No, 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 no. What was we your favourite? We interview people all the time. We, are, we know how to detect when people are deflecting. This is like bloody. <laughs> but the show's not about me, boys. The show's about you guys. <laughs> <laughs> not bad, not bad. Thank you. <laughs> All righty, for the money miners yes, wondering. I think, I think she was thinking I was coming in to kiss her then. So <laughs> <laughs> the fear in her eyes. Oh. So we've got a, a ripper interview with Sam Berridge, as, uh, as Stroth mentioned, from Perennials. So we interviewed him, one of our earliest interviews on the show, probably six or seven months ago now. Yeah, super, super smart dude. Loves talking mining and finance. Loves listening to people. Yep. The, loves talking to people that want to listen to him because he sounds like his wife doesn't listen to yeah, him. He's got quite a receptive mining crowd here. Finance. So <laughs> we're, uh, mate, we'll have him anytime. We, typical one, we planned for an hour. We chatted for an hour and a half. So we're going to split it up into two parts because it was a bloody sensational yarn. So part, part one, we go macro. We talk a lot about within Australia, around the world, China, a lot about commodities, energy transition, talking because he's he's heavily invested in uranium. Mm. Um, so yeah, energy transition in Australia, pros and cons of bulk lithium storage well versus versus, the energy. Yeah. Yeah. versus going down the approval and construction of are we if getting uranium into Australia? Yeah, he's bloody nice. And if you follow him on Twitter or LinkedIn, you see on that energy theme he posts uh, a bit about gas on the east coast in particular as well. So just tying that out and then. We'll, uh, we'll leave part two, you know. Should be out tomorrow. That's it. For for how much he knows, how many people work with him or does he do all this himself? I think. He, he has a co-PM. As we get into in the show, he runs, you know, a couple of different uh, funds. Yeah. The, mm. the strategic and the, the micro cap fund. Yeah. Yeah, right. It's like he's got a bloody analyst there or something feeding him, but he must do it all himself. Well, I yeah. Not I, everyone's as, not every organisation superhuman like no, him, and they do need analysts. They do need people. Yeah, they do need people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Where do you get people, mate? Well, they, I do know these guys called JP Search that can actually facilitate <laughs> companies that aren't as um, at the level of Sam Berridge. Are you mate, what did JP Search do? JP, so I would say niche recruitment. <laughs> For the finance industry, are you niche, trying to place someone for Sammy Berridge? Now? Niche, niche. Well, <laughs> Sammy, if you are, no, there's actually a couple other people looking for, but we will yeah. forward Sammy on if he does need That's someone right. to just take the load off a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> I've got a job offer. Tell me, I've got a job offer. Yeah, I, I'm the I'm the middleman here. Yeah, mate. No, so they're not trying to hire you. No, no, sorry. You haven't received the offer. <laughs> Jeez, look, he's getting excited there. I'd <laughs> be able to get rid of this prick. It's mate, concern, mate. JP Search are looking, still looking for for the two large family officers in Perth, uh, investment analyst associates. Financial modelling capabilities a must. What sort of uh, experience would you need for this sort of role? Mate, well, it's more, not, not much. Zero to five <laughs> years out of uni. Zero to five. Yep. But- Look, from what I hear, valuation capability, but it's pretty hard to is it? It's pretty hard to break into the strategy in M M and A. Is uh, it pretty hard? It is actually really hard. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, and but you need for the, for this role. I'm talking good level. They, they're looking for a good level of uh, problem solving skills. By good level, I mean outstanding problem solving skills. <laughs> <laughs> That's better than good. We're talking outstanding problem-solving skills. Now, boys, you mentioned uh, how much experience, consultant, zero to five years out of uni. But right. in terms of consultancy experience. None. Yeah. Is that for the gig as a consultant? None. Consultants, yeah. I mean, I, I don't think I'll have consultants personally. None. But if you want a shit job, then go get it's one. It's not looked upon favourably <laughs> there either. Agreed. Boys, you'd consider yourselves pretty smart. 
No. Eh. But I'm no. learning He's every day. He's pretty smart. I'm a student, not a, not a bloody uh, a whiz. Well, a, this uh, analyst, this family office analyst role. Yeah. Got to be pretty smart. Right. I'm talking. Really bloody smart. <laughs> Really bloody smart. They're looking for someone really bloody smart. Put a line through us then. Right. Get in touch. And of most importance, what everyone <laughs> wants to bloody know. Pays really good. <laughs> <laughs> Get in touch with JP Search. Oh, oh I'll love. give him my CV. <laughs> now, boys, right, before we get into Sammy's episode, I reckon we do a trip to uh, – we've got to go on a road trip. I think a mine site – or something, I reckon, to the roots, Trav, Goldfields. Mm. I, I reckon could, we could do a little money of mine road show. I'd be pretty keen on that. Um, yeah. Like, do you think in We're just- flying. <laughs> We're flying. That's not a road trip. After driving the diggers, bugger it. We're flying and Brooks Airways <laughs> are taking us there. Mate, they can land on the shittest runways in the <laughs> Goldfields. Mate, I've got it sorted, I reckon. Too com- and too competitive, too bloody- too yeah. competitive, the lineup just to get into a Qantas mate, plane. Mate, Brooks, oh, wicked brand already, but with Qantas's brand going down the pooper, mate, Brooks is the premium airline. I'm going to hit up Stewie Brooks. <laughs> and you know the beauty? If we do have it at a mine site and someone goes ass up in a pit, breaks their <laughs> leg, whatever, Brooks have also got the Learjets yeah. that do Medivacs. They look wicked. So we can actually they get do. there via Brooks and then in the event of a – an accident or something, right? We get we they can actually get us out before uh, the scheduled return flight. So, mate, they, that's awesome. What an offering! What an offering! Even if we go to Bali and we go ass up on a scooter and we haven't got insurance, the Brooks Medivac can Medivac. actually get us yeah. out of Bali as well. Yeah, mate, talk about it. Talk about an offering. Six Learjets they've got that sort out the Medivacs because not, not all mining companies, all and gas companies, so a lot of them have to have a private Medivac. Provider, so Brooks actually the Brooks Learjets uh, work with them a lot as well. That's wicked. So, I'm sure cool. there's some bloody people sitting on a lot of paper wealth from um, Missouri Wildcat at the moment. Mate, just go for a go, trip to Bali. Go. Take Brooks Medivac with you. Yeah, go bloody go nuts <laughs> on a scooter. You can Brooks will get probably you don't home, need mate. the Medivac. You can just use the, the normal <laughs> Learjet. For... Mate, don't forget the King Airs land on the shittest runways in the gold fields. Mate, they can even hot shot parts up the side if your jumbo's fucked. Bloody, mate, they can get a cylinder up to keep the steels turning. Mate, they do it all. One three hundred airways. Oh, love it. And every seat has a life jacket. Yeah. And it- Unlike. This seat, life jacket. This seat, life jacket. This seat, life jacket soon. <laughs> Have we confirmed if... If that is Stewie Brooks yet. <laughs> no, yet to, yet to be determined, but Stewie Brooks has life jackets in every suit, unlike Omar Barber. Omar Barber. Right, as much fun as this is, let's get into part one with Sammy Berridge. Sam Berridge. Thanks to Struth for the intro. Here we go. Money miners. We're heading back to the to the roots of our show here. Gone down memory lane, one aren't we? One of the first fundies that we ever interviewed, and we've just mm. figured out the other day. We're in the same building, yeah, Mr. Out. Sam Berridge. I, I came down to introduce myself. I don't think you guys figured it out. I was <laughs> walking past the sign and came to say day. I see you walked out. You're walking out the front. I'm like, I bloody know that bloke. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I can see your office is getting slowly, uh, you know, more and more flashes uh, each time I walk past. So, yeah. uh, you know, you guys have been doing a great job. So, I, thought, uh, I thought I'd like there's um, – Probably plenty of fundies that are probably trying to avoid us in the building, but uh, we've conned you into coming, <laughs> coming on, mate. Oh, no, it's always happy to come and have a chat. Uh, uh, last time we spoke to you, we were just we didn't even have video capability. I think we just called you on the phone. And, um, mate, now now you're in a studio. We've got your, your good-looking mug on camera for oh, the world to see. Uh, <laughs> yeah, studio better, better over the phone. <laughs> <laughs> the still image. <laughs> right, yeah, Jada, you've got the spiel. You've got bloody Sammy's autobiography uh, biography there that you've written. But mate, Trav, Trav had set up the opening question, so I wouldn't steal the thunder. Oh, but we, we want to talk about the uh, the state of the market to start. And I'll uh, leave it with you there, Trav. Oh yeah, mate. He, he asked you for Sammy's biography, not a not a bloody question. At the biography. <laughs> oh, we're just going. We're just going to say this is Sam <laughs> Sam Berridge from uh, Perennial. He knows shitloads. Oh, uh, the money miners would it's have perennial, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, that's the one. What's mate, the other one mind. that sounds similar that I get it mixed up? Oh, with? perpetual. Perpetual. Yeah, yeah. That, <laughs> yeah, that, that is. And as the the money miners would have heard in the intro that we're going to do before this one, Sammy had 
I think five or so years experience in the field as a, as a geo, mm-hmm. then also worked as a, a mining analyst on the equity research sell side of things before about a decade now with perennial. Yeah, just over a decade, 11 years. I didn't um, know you were a rock licker, Sammy. Yeah, yeah mate, go. back in the day, I was, uh, I was with the, the Equigold guys that turned into Regis, that turned into Capricorn. Can get into that later on as well. Yeah, can do. And uh, now you are running a couple of different funds at Perennial. So you've got the micro cap as well as the uh, strategic resources fund. Yeah, that's right. So strategic natural resources is is larger cap. So, you know, circa four to five billion sort of average market cap um, across that, although there is a bit of a spectrum in there. And then the micro cap resources stocks is sort of in that sub 500 mil, you know, really getting down into the weeds type stuff. Are we, were you two and one when you were doing GO for... Equi? Yeah, I was, and yeah, they wouldn't change they, it. That's how they bloody <laughs> save so much money. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's oh, two and one. No, they point point uh, point blank refused to move off that, and um, you liked two and one. Me? No, I didn't. But they <laughs> they wouldn't change. Oh, they would. Yeah, yeah, yeah still haven't. Hey, Sammy's at Fundy now, which is uh, there's no you know two and one. It's, it's two you're and in, zero in Perth all the time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, two and zero, but I'm the guy. Right, yeah. Lead it away, lads, mate. We were and when you popped in last time, great shooting this shooting the shit session about everything in the market, and then I'm pumped to do another one. Big time. This is it. Big you're time. Here. Sammy Burridge. Mm-hmm. Let's just kick things off by talking about the state of the market right now. Um, I'm pretty kind of I guess keen to unpack your thoughts on. Why is like this point in time today, mate, like in what ways is it different as an active investor compared to other parts of your 11-year career at Perennial? Um, I think for the, for the biggest part is, is is that we're dealing with higher rates and inflation. So for, you know, anyone who's only who's been investing or just for, you know, in the markets for the last 11 years, you've almost had declining rates for, for all of that period. It's only the last... Um, 18 months or so, which rates have been going up and going up pretty fast. So that changes, you know, changes a lot. All of a sudden, all these companies that, that don't make any money um, and rely on basically free money to fund themselves, that free money has gone. So, you know, you need to be um, adding tangible value or producing cash flow um, to, you know, to retain investor interest. And I think that's the biggest def- de- um, challenge or ch- difference over the, you know, that we're dealing with at the moment. But then the next big question is, is how long does that last for? So I think the, the biggest sort of question mark in markets, and this goes across all asset classes and, and all asset types, is um, is what is the trajectory of interest rates from here and specifically in the US because they, you know, that makes the world go round. Um, you know, is are we going to have flat rates for the next two years or are we going to have a pretty sharp pullback um, in rates if, um, if things really do start to crack? So... That's the uh, the multi billion dollar question. And I'd, I'd seen you reshare an article um, on Stan Druckenmiller, and he the article was sort of premised on his bet that the uh, the yield curve is going to steepen again. Him betting that yields in the shorter term duration, sort of two years and uh, closer, are going to drop off dramatically. Are you you know of a similar sort of thought, or do you have a different view? Yes, I, I sem- certainly have a bit of sympathy um, for that. Um, I think there is cracks both in Australia and in the US um, that are that haven't made their way into employment data yet or unemployment data. But things like um, uh, automotive loan delinquencies are above GFC levels. So that people are really struggling to hold on to their cars in the US. That's a, that's a lead indicator, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, looking, it's looking pretty average. Um, there's some others around like a um, ability to, you know, once you become unemployed, how long you stay unemployed for. So that time is really blown out and that's indicative of unemployment going up overall. Um, you know, there's, I suppose, home loans, uh, home loan origination in the US has really gone through the floor. So, you know, housing prices are hanging, hanging in there okay, but, you know, there's, um, there's not a lot of people, there's not a lot of appetite for buying, for buying new houses. Here in Australia, um, I think it was the CBA uh, when they announced their result, they had a chart in their deck um, that showed that um, uh, credit card um, repayments sort of that have sort of gone beyond ninety days. That's starting to creep up a little bit. So there's a re- there is a lot of hurt um, around the world from these higher rates, but it hasn't translated into into um, a big tick up in unemployment yet. But I I think it's I think it's coming. Mm, so that'd you be a big change for markets. Wouldn't want to have a bloody mortgage in Sydney at the moment. 
nah, it's <laughs> people up to, a lot of people up to their eyeballs in debt over there and, and they can't refinance and they can't afford it and, and all this sort of stuff. It's really is, um, it really is pretty crook. But then, you know, this complicates things. If you sort of split the um, who's doing the heavy lifting in terms of cutting back on their expenditure to try and bring down inflation, it's those be, um, below the age of 45. So if you're over the age of 55, chances are most of your mortgage is paid off. You're probably making a little bit more money on your deposits. Um, you're, you're spending money, you know, pretty freely. You might even be spending more than what you were 12 months ago. At least that's what the CBA data seems to suggest. Whereas if you're below 45, you've just taken out a mortgage, you're up to your eyeballs in debt, you know, particularly if you just started a family down on single income, those people are really hurting at the moment and they're the ones in isolation that are trying to pull back or that are pulling back on their expenditure and, you know, that's trying to drag down inflation. So the, the, the burden's really been unevenly um, carried at the moment and, you know, you take that, you know, you extrapolate that, it's going to end up having political issues at some point, but we'll, you know, leave the politics out of the chat for now, I think. Mm. <laughs> how, how does that, that macro, how has that affected the flow of money from the US into the Australian mining investment? Um, oh, I think that's, I mean, the big, big end of town is is reasonably immune in the resources space because generally speaking, like in the US, you know, whether they're talking copper producers or, or lithium producers or um, or even the oil and gas guys, I mean, they're still making reasonable amounts of cash. And so, you know, they they have been coming down to Australia. I mean, Albemarle came down here. I mean, SQM, the South American, but they've come down here, um, you know, looking to uh, grow their, their, their lithium production. I mean, we haven't had the copper producers down there yet, but, you know, because Australia is a reasonably safe place to invest and because we can you know, permit a project and, and allow it to get into production within a reasonable time frame. I think we will always be on the radar of um, of those global players. I just wanted one more comment from you on uh, on the broad macro issues. You'd uh, highlighted um, some words that Jerome Powell, the, the chair of the Fed in America, had said regarding the sort of unsustainability of the US debt level. Have you got more thoughts you could share on that? Yeah, it's a worry. I mean, there's one for the gold bugs, um, you know, comments like that. It's, it's pretty unusual to have the chair of the Fed come out and, and criticise, you know, the government's basically saying this is unsustainable, we've got to do something about it. Um, and they're not doing anything about it. Like I think the the House or, um, in the US still doesn't have a speaker uh, after the last bloke got turfed. Um, and they're coming up to another debt ceiling, I think, at, towards the end of November. And there's no, you know, the, the whole politi- the political sort of, Bring, um, brinkmanship over there has all made things completely dysfunctional. Wasn't Trump putting his hand up for the speaker? <laughs> I, I heard that. I think that was happening uh, at one stage. I think he entertained it, <laughs> but I think he's got his eye on the um, on the top job again. Um, so we'll find out find out about that next year. But yet, I mean, all the charts all say the same thing. Like at, at, on current settings, U.S. debt just blows through, you know, into the you know multiple multiple trillions of dollars. I think I saw one the other I saw one the other day saying that the U.S interest bill will exceed its defence spending by 2027. Wow. Um, yeah, so – but then you've got a like a voter base that is sort of um, not interested in austerity. Like you're trying to explain to them like, oh, look, sorry, the government's got to cut back. We can't spend this much money on anything anymore. The other side will just say, well, no, you don't have to cut back. We can go – we can keep this – kicking this can down the road forever. But sooner or later it's going to matter. Um, and I think it's, you know, whilst um, real rates we are quite high at the moment, which is usually bearish for gold, the gold price has completely ignored it um, for the last 18 months. And I think that's because the gold market is looking at what comes next. It is the only way to, to <laughs> delever or, you know, fix the uh, unsustainable debt, sustain high inflation? Yeah, oh, I mean, that's, that's part of it. You can inflate your way out of it for sure. Um, but it certainly helps if you just if you stop racking up more debt each year after year after year after year. So, you know, and, and you know, governments probably need to start having a look at some of their their spend and just making sure they're getting a bit of bang for their buck. Like it's all right for the government spending money, and for every dollar they spend, you might get a dollar fifty or two dollars back if you you know you're building infrastructure or or, or or other bits and pieces that facilitate business growth. But when you f- keep on funneling cash into endeavours that return nothing or a complete waste of money. Um, you know, like the uh, you know, like the Olympics in Melbourne or something like that. Um, you know, you don't get a return on that, and so that's just you know, an interest. There's interest attached to that expenditure, which you're going to have to bear and pay off the old-fashioned way. 
So switching continents now to China, when we last spoke, it was a bit over half a year ago, and there was still a, a bit of a consensus amongst resource investors that China was going to stimulate. They'd come out of their their COVID lockdowns, which last, lasted quite a while, but the, the stimulus never really eventuated. And we're hearing more and more about the issues in the property sector in China, issues about, you know, the, uh, the demographics not looking great at all, the very high level of unemployment or youth unemployment. Mm-hmm. What's your view on China? Is Have you sort of written off any chance of a big stimulus that would, you know, spur commodity prices along? Have you got any more thoughts on uh, how China's looking at the moment? Um, they, they're going to have to do more, I think. I think the status quo, if left as is, things get worse and worse over there and you end up in sort of negative feedback loops where, if, you know, one you know, a few property developers go broke and then they dra- drag some banks down with them and, you know, you end up with this negative feedback loop and, and people getting unemployed and stuff. So I don't think the, um, I don't think the status quo is, is acceptable or can be left as is. Why it's taken them so long to um, act decisively, I'm not quite sure. Um, I think if I had to guess, I mean, uh, I mean, I think the Chinese government is very wary of that point that was just made earlier is that they don't want to waste money on, you know, building apartments that no one's going to live in or, or bridges to nowhere or any of that stuff. So I think that has happened through pe- previous stimulus um, efforts. So this time around, they want to be a little bit more careful. Um, but they're going to have to do something because, um, you know, nobody's interested in buying homes up there. If no one's buying sort of uh, homes in the secondary market, that means people are less inclined to um, engage with property developers for new construction. You know, without new construction, then you don't have it, you've got an employment issue and the whole thing goes on and on and on. I mean, property, I think, is still around 25% of GDP in China. It's a massive sector. So I find it difficult to believe that they can just let it wither on the vine. So I'll have to do something at some point. But, you know, as usual, the, the billion-dollar question is is when, and I'm not sure when that'll be. And on the theme of Chinese sort of austerity, we've seen over the past couple of years the, the spending from the Chinese, both state and private, In foreign countries, you know, the One Belt, One Road initiative really sort of wind down. That was one of the dominant themes throughout the 2010s, Mm -hmm. especially in the the commodities world, all across Africa, throughout Asia, that they were investing in infrastructure, mining assets. And the the figures have just dropped off and off and off. And do you see, you know, in that line of austerity, it being more untenable for the Chinese government to spend overseas as opposed to in-country? Yeah, I think that's fair. I think it's probably become less appealing. Um, you know, it's not a great feeling where you go lend money to all these uh, countries and they can't, you know, can't get it back again. Um, it'd be pretty embarrassing if you've got to go write off, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars because some country defaulted. Um, so I think, you know, being that the cost of money has gone up for everyone, um, I think their their appetite to do more of that is probably diminished. Mind you, you know, I think probably geopolitical, you know, brinksmanship or whatever might outweigh financial concerns in, in some of those investments. Um, you know, if they want to go and, you know, build bases in the in the South Pacific or whatever. Um, but, you know, in terms of large sta- large scale infrastructure spend, um, yes, yeah, certainly I think that probably comes comes back in again um, back into a um, you know more reasonable level. Sammy, given the um given this top down look of the the market from a from a macro angle where are you seeing the most opportunity as an active manager of, of capital today? You know, be, be as be as narrow as you can, kind of sector, industry, commodity, slice it, slice it how you like. Yeah, I think. Um, I mean, because obviously, I mean, in the in the in the commodities business and investing in mining and, and energy, um, the portfolio at the moment is probably you know, leveraged to green and gold. Um, so that's be gold and uranium. Uh, gold for the men problem uh, for the reasons I've just mentioned. Not, uh, not green gold. Zone one of them, mate. <laughs> No, but uh, certainly our, our two biggest commodity exposures would be in, in gold and uranium. Uranium slightly bigger. Um, I think that, uh, um, I mean, this energy transition gets talked about a lot, um, is struggling. I mean, people don't really want, some people don't want to admit it, but, you know, wind projects being cancelled left, right and centre overseas, the number of renewable projects t- um, taking their final investment decision, decision sorry, in Australia has wound down um, and it's because these projects don't make any money. Um, so, you know, either there needs to be more government money thrown at the sector to, to re, you know, reinvigorate it. And, um, we had the treasurer, I think he gave a speech in Melbourne a couple of weeks ago, implying that that was what was going to take place, but they need to be careful because, you know, this, they need to get a return on this cash. Um, 
but that also, you know, while the you know some of this uh, renewable rollout is, is struggling a bit, it opens the door further, I think, for uh, for nuclear. And I think that the risks um, to uranium demand uh, lie further, to, um, definitely to the upside in that. And that doesn't that doesn't have to include include Australia. I mean, what we do down here is irrelevant for global uranium demand. But I think more glo- globally, um, you know, people will start to pivot in that direction. Well, it's. It would be good to hear your view on this about energy transition because it obviously depends who's uh, which side of the fence you talk to because I talk to someone that works in the, the renewable space like wind turbines, battery and everything and he was saying these large-scale lithium batteries and wind setups, he, from his view, were the most cost-effective way to do it. He said Snowy Hydro was going to cost about $12 billion for two gigawatts of power. Of storage, yeah, yeah, I storage. think so. And then these, they were installing, I think it was a lithium battery set up one gig for one billion. And then he was thinking it's going to, their view is, is nuclear going to be able to one, get approved and then be constructed to produce cheaper than that? You'd be, with all your DOSH invested in uranium, I'm sure you've got a pretty strong view on how you see this energy transition going. What is it? Yeah, I, um, I mean... Without knowing the details of the specific project, um, when you um, add storage into a um, into a renewable system, so that you can actually get twenty four seven power, um, the big question is, well, how much storage? And this is a you know a question where you know you get some you know reasonably baseless answers to it, but then you know otherwise in other in other times you just get people just refuse to ins- um, refuse to answer it, and because the light's going out is just absolutely devastating for an economy. You need to have additional storage there. You can't, you can't have just enough. It needs to be ample. And, um, you know, because to build, you know, the where, whatever it is, the, the seventh day or the second week or the, thir- or the second month or whatever of storage is, is so prohibitively expensive, I think that there will always be a, a, um, a space for gas at the end. Yep. But, um, you know, because it's so cheap to store, it just sits there in the ground. It doesn't cost you cost you much to store. It can just sit there until you need it. But then you don't need to use it until, you know, you don't have to use it unless, unless you do need it. But to circle back to your your um, question, I think a 100% renewable grid is prohibitively expensive. And if it was, um, you know, if it was cheaper than the fossil fuel alternatives, then that's exactly what people would be building now. You know, you'd see it on the mine sites and stuff everywhere. Whereas, I mean, you know, we've got a great example of actually of, of what can be done at the moment um, via Bellevue, which they've gone as hard as they can, I think, on the on the renewable front. And I think they uh, they've quoted eighty percent um, of their power will come from re- renewable sources. And to achieve that, they um, you know they've had to build um, a fifteen megawatt gas power station. So they've always got something there back up. But then they've built I can't remember the exact numbers, but it's you know, circa 13 megawatts of solar and maybe 15 megawatts of wind. And I think they've got um, 13 megawatt hours of, of battery storage as well. So normally their power solution would have been just the 15 megawatts of gas and that would have cost them roughly 15 million bucks of CapEx. Or not them, but their, their energy provider, like roughly 15 million bucks. The other s- solution to, with the wind and the solar and the, um, and the battery storage, that's around $100 million all up. Wow. So I've been told. So you need to... Obviously, under the, the renewable solution, you, you use less gas, so that's where your money's being saved, but you need to use less gas over a long period of time to get all your, your capital back there. And 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 I think on top of that, they've actually built a crusher which is twice the size it needs to be so they can just run the crusher when the wind is blowing. So that's the flexibility that you don't have if you're talking about the, a grid. You know, you, so people wake up in the morning, they go to work and they go home at night, generally speaking. You can't tell these people that, oh, hang on, the wind's blowing you know, at th- two o'clock in the morning, so you guys have got to go to work because that's when power is cheapest. Like these are the realities of trying to fit intermittent um, supply into a, you know a a, um, a daily schedule that most of us you know have is pretty pretty uh, pretty much set. I think something that gets forgotten about of solar in for mining operations is desert dust <laughs> and the solar panels. It's not a She's not a free exercise. Like I think cleaning them and maintaining them is is a significant cost. So there there is a cost associated with it. Yeah. So as you said, it's not a it's not a not a cheap alternative. No, you're dead right. I remember going past some solar panels. I think out by Karasu Dam or something, and they were um you know they were 
Dusty as uh, you know, Dusty as the as the punters after um, the Melbourne <laughs> Cup. No, I don't <laughs> think they work as well covered <laughs> in dust. Anyway, Sam, you've uh, written quite a bit about small modular reactors. Mm-hmm. So I'm keen to ask you. We've sort of beaten around the bush, but haven't really spoken with someone that seems so close to it as you. First of all, like, how much of a role does this play in your uranium nuclear thesis? I think it's a pretty pretty big part. And so, firstly, like when I say clo- when you say close to them, like you know, we're, we're investors. Like we try and uh, we try and learn. You, you've it. read more than we have. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sure you're not just punting all the money on uranium because it's going to be the next. I'm sure there's a bit of a method behind the madness. No, so you know, when you're looking at supply and demand, I mean, we don't build our own models up from scratch. But what we do do is is look at where does the risk sit in terms of demand and, and supply. So if you're looking at demand, that's when the small modular reactors come into it. And for the most part, the assumptions around demand from small modular reactors is pretty low or or zero, depending on whose demand forecast you're looking at. Um, And they're they're being dismissed. I mean, New Scale went broke the other day. And so, you know, lots of people are going, oh, look at this, it's not going to work. But I mean, if you're a if you're a company with no no income trying to build a very capital intensive um, and, um, you know, new sort of techni- new project. I mean, the risks of going broke, <laughs> you know, not no, never far away. But um, for some of the other guys uh, that build these things, like, you know, Westinghouse, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, the, the, these guys have been building small modular reactors um, for the US Navy for 50 years. You know, it's not a new technology. I mean, there's a pedigree of success here, which is hard to argue with. And you'd probably be unwise to bet against them that they will get one of these things working in the civilian sphere. So, I mean, they've got a couple of different models out. One's the AP300, which 300 just stands for 300 megawatts. That'll, um, you know, that's the sort of thing that you could have on the outside outskirts of town. And, you know, you need probably a couple of them to run a, um, a city the size of Perth. But they've got this other one called the Evinci uh, reactor, which is only five megawatts. So I think that by itself would be enough to run a town with about 2,000 or so people in them. So it's only quite small. Or a small mine. Yeah, exactly. Or a couple yeah, a couple of them together would, would, um, would look after a mine for sure. Um, Can you daisy chain them? Do they, yeah, yeah. It's as simple as that. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Is that, yeah. So, yeah, think, yeah so, so that said, you know, 50 years in the making, why aren't we seeing them roll out more? Like obviously they're not completely ready, ready, but... I think it's the, the regulatory headwinds for bringing these things into the civilian sphere are or have been prohibitive. So post, um, you know, post Chernobyl, the post Fukushima, um, the appetite for new nuclear tech went to zero. Um, and then after that, you had the the National Regulatory Commission in the US, which um, you know they're the gatekeepers for for new reactor designs. Some of the um, hurdles that they put in place of new designs were just prohibitive, like you'd never get over them. Like, you know, they had scenarios where, um, you know, if your reactor blew up um, or had a catastrophic catastrophic failure um, uh, at the first year of production and then every year for its 40-year life and the people that lived nearby never moved, how much radiation would they get? And then, you know, that they had was limits around that and all that sort of stuff. Like a scenario that if you applied it to a, um, a car or a plane or, you know, even a bike, you know, none of us would be using any of them, we'd all be walking. So I think there was punitive um, regulations that just stalled advancement of, of the industry. But those have been wound back now. You've got bipartisan support in the US for new nuclear tech and, you know, you've got this big list of, um, of, react- of, of companies. So I think I've stuck it on LinkedIn. There's about 15 different reactor designs that I listed off there that are all progressing. There's about $220 billion of market cap which are supporting that R&D effort. So the fact that new scale fell over really doesn't matter. There's as well as some state-owned or half semi-state-owned yeah. enterprises as yeah, well. Yeah, 100%. So I think as, um, when I put the list together, um, it reminded me very much of the list of um, pharmaceutical companies that were um, trying to develop COVID vaccines back in sort of 2020. And one of them was was going to work. Turns out a couple of them worked, kind of. Um but I think the but same. They had, the, they had the regulation very much on their side. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. and the public public sentiment. Like, yeah, wow, well, for the most part. The, the 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 speaking of stuff you posted on LinkedIn, Sam. I remember um, like a few months ago, you, you shared this uh, video from from Hayden Morrison and from Aiden Morrison, and it mm-hmm. was basically like the, there's a piece of the discussion around renewables, um, which which you know you haven't mentioned yet, but I think kind of ties into this whole thing, and that's the way that we think about the cost of transmission. Mm-hmm. Um, how, how do you kind of, like, how do you internalise that part of the debate 
and the way that it's been like you know brought out in in media and politics and everything and then compare it to your thesis on on uranium weigh the two against each other yeah, it's a good question. Um, and I, I've got to give credit to, to Aidan Morrison because he's, um, you know, he's waded through, um, you know, reams and reams of very bureaucratic energy documents to find the answers that he has. And he sets them all out with nice screenshots of what he's talking about. So um, he's, uh, he's doing, the, uh, doing the Lord's work down over there. <laughs> um, but to, to get back to your point, like I think the way that the costs have been reported have, are very disingenuous. So when um, – uh, Chris Bowen or whoever comes out and says, you know, the CSIRO uh, report, GenCos report says renewables are cheaper. Um, who do you think he's talking about? Like for the customers? Because he's not. Like the CSIRO qualified this last month. They said their GenCos report is written from the point of view of investors, not customers. So if you're an investor in renewables, you don't have to pay for the transmission. You don't have to pay for the firming. Well, you do now if you want to get connected to the grid, but it's a separate issue. But the customer, the customer has to cover the cost of, of transmission. I mean, that still sits there in the connection fee in their bill. Oh, and then the power price is is, um, is on top of that. So it's the gen cost report is as you know is is for written from the point of view of the investors, not of the customer. But the customer is the one that you know that pays the bills. So when you all add all this stuff up together, um, the out, the the, um, the outcome is that this renewable, uh, sorry, a renewable heavy transition is going to be much more expensive than what we've been led to believe. It's certainly going to result in higher power costs, and we're already seeing that. Um, and so, you know, if that's the case, um, then perhaps you know people will start saying, "Well, hang on, if this is going to cost all this additional money, then well, what other what other alternatives are there?" And that's where. The, some, the nuclear discussion um, might get a bit of an airing in Australia, but you know, I, you know, whether or not we we end up adopting here in Australia or not, as I said, is is really irrelevant. I think we'll just follow what happens in the rest of the world, and you know, that's where those SMRs are being. You know, there's reams of them being developed all over the place. So, one of them will work, a couple of them will work, um, and then they'll be adopted down here. Um, but what, actually, what I think is really a good idea, and I don't know, it'd be interesting to see what the what the polling on this would be. Is like BHP have come out and said, well, you know, we need nuclear if we want to decarbonise our operations. So why wouldn't you let them go and build one up in the Pilbara somewhere, you know, way, well away from where anybody lives? All the costs are borne by BHP. They can decarbonise using it if they, if they want, if, you know, if that's the way they want to go. And then if it works, well, you know, the rest of the country can have a look at it and say, oh, well, seems to work okay and this is what the costs are. Maybe we want to have this as a solution for the rest of the country. So, yeah, it's just a thought. How does I know I mentioned battery before, but does the battery and power storage does that only apply to the renewables? Does the to the SMRs and everything work? Is there the direct the power just comes straight out of that? There's no there's no storage component. Mm. How does do you know? No, you, you don't. It doesn't really. I mean, it just. I mean, you can look at a as a SMR as a, a battery that you you don't need to charge the first time you use it. And this is where, like, if there's one chart that um, that sums up the appeal of nuclear tech, it is, speaks to that exact point of storage. So lithium batteries, whilst they've come a long way over the last 15 years, their energy density is still around about 0.6 to 0.7 megajoules per kilo. Now compare that to wood, which is like 18 megajoules per kilo. And yes, you can recharge your battery, but still energy density is, density is quite low. And because the energy density is quite low, you need huge batteries to store, you know, a, um, a, a little bit of power. And that's why they're so expensive. Whereas you go all the way up the scale of energy density and you've got uranium sitting on the, on the right-hand side, that's got an um, energy density of around about 80.6 million megajoules per kilo. Like the shit is jam-packed with power. And yes, it is true that you don't get all of that out on the first time you use it, so you need to recycle your, your fuel rods after that. But from an energy storage point of view, that is a massive, massive benefit. And I've done the back of an envelope as part of, you know, investing in the uranium space. And if you look at an SMR and you can sort of pick what your capex cost is and then increase it by 50% just to be conservative or even 200% if you want, your um, storage cost works out to be in the realm of three to five cents per kilowatt hour. Now, that, compare that to your Tesla Powerwall, your cost of storage there is about $900 to $1,000 per kilowatt hour. Wow. So there's <laughs> orders of magnitude difference. Yeah. So that's, you know, this is this is some of the stuff that you look at and you think, well, you know, maybe this has got potential. But that, that um, energy density is kind of a... Um, paradoxically a counter argument to the to the uranium bull thesis because 
you don't need too much uranium to get a large result. So mm. the mar- the existing incumbents can kind of just crank up supply at the margins and 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 meet the um, meet the demand requirements, and then price you know m- maybe doesn't actually go to the go to the moon like everyone anticipates. How do you how do you weigh that up in your uranium thesis? Oh, you, you're 100 percent right, and it's a very very um it's a very fair point. Is that you know the best and worst thing about uranium is a little <laughs> bit of it yeah. goes a long way. Yeah. And just to highlight that, so the global uranium supply at the moment is about 65,000 tonnes per annum um, and produces circa 9% of global electricity. So if you wanted to turn that 9% into 100%, then you'd end up with uranium demand of about 720,000 tonnes per annum. So you wouldn't even crack a million. You know, it's, it would be a tiny market and can hypothetically produce, you know, all the world's electricity for the year, carbon free. So you, you're dead right. But then you know, with, inquest- with investing, you come down to a when. Like, yes, you, sh- you could definitely do that, but when and how long would it take and what does the price do in the, um, in the interim? So tying all this into a, an investment thesis that you are, um, you're currently trying to see play out is the East Coast gas market you've, you've written about. So from a sort of you know, broad strokes point of view, you've got a lack of investment, gas fields winding down, it leaves the the east coast, you know, Sydney, Brisbane, Melbourne, exposed or reliant on good weather. Is is that the sort of uh, broad strokes getting that right there? Yeah, I think that's dead right. Um, I, could, I I still can't join the dots on um on the state state policy and, and federal policy with this energy transition. Like you know, the CSIRO, AEMO, everybody that has any credibility in this area says you know we're going to need gas as a, as a transition fuel for for a long time. And yeah, we'll use less of it, but we're going to use need some of it for a long time and it's a hell of a lot better than coal. So there's nobody credible out there that says, oh, we can go to 100% renewables and we don't need any more gas. Um, and yet, you know, exploration onshore was banned in Victoria in 2012. It was a long time ago. I mean, New South Wales have, has stimmied the development of that Darabri project, which I think is still going through mm. um, approvals. And, Forever. Yeah. And all the while, like the gas, you know, is getting used up. And if you don't replace it, well, it's going to run out. And that's sort of what's what's going to happen. So that Bass Strait field, which um, Woodside and um, and Exxon run, which produces, I think, roughly 70% of the domestic gas demand on the East Coast, um, Exxon was out, was out in the AFR in March of this year saying, well, you know, the number of productive wells from that field will halve between now and winter of 2024. So, you know, that's cause for concern. But would you, you know, would you think, oh, well, you know, we better look at doing something here to replace this because we're still going to need it? Or instead you had, um, you know, I think the Victorians came out and they said, oh, they banned gas appliances for new buildings instead. So they try to reduce the demand side rather than solving the supply. But the problem is, of course, the supply is going to fall much faster than the demand is. So, um, yeah, I mean, gas price, if you, you speak to any um, big um, you know, big industrial user or, or utility um, trying to get long-term gas in the East Coast now is near on impossible. And you're looking at 14 to $16 plus. So, you know, that's still well above where prices are at the moment. It's certainly not being reflected in equity prices, I think. Um, but uh, that's, uh, that's what's going to happen. I can't – it's difficult to see how it can be avoided. We, we talk about mining almost every day and rarely talk about uh, gas. But the, the one kind of – yeah – observation that I'd make, which might not be super obvious to the the listener who only ever looks at mining companies, is just that depletion rate curve when, when you're talking about gas. Like, you know, in, in mining, if you stop sort of, um, if you just go with the status quo, you might keep producing at the same throughput over mm. time. But gas, like these, these de- the, the, the reserves, they, they deplete at this like exponentially declining rate. And the moment you kind of crank down the capex, like you're faced with declining supply, um, you need you need to spend more money to even maintain that supply. It's just like mm-hmm. the, 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 a double edge. Like it just you get stabbed in both directions from it. And I think that's kind of part of the the thesis you speak to on that. Yeah, scenario. yeah, hundred percent. And and you know, people that aren't close to the industry, I mean, you people that you know that like talk about mining that know nothing about it. Quite you know, it doesn't take long for them to put their foot in their mouth. And it's the same thing with with oil and gas. Um, you know, people think that if you, yeah, that this stuff just runs by itself, but you don't, you know, you do have a natural decline rate. And I think the global average is around about 8% per annum. So if you, you know, put wound capex back to zero, then both for oil and gas, um, you know, I think that production would decline by about roughly 8% per annum. And that is, that decline rate is far faster than the way that demand will roll over as part of the energy transition. So 
got supply dropping faster than demand, you end up with a deficit market and prices go up. And every stance here in the world prohibits investment. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. To, to try and understand the, the thesis even better, what are the, the pitfalls from your point of view? Would it be like a government backtracking or, you know, where can the where can this investment thesis fall over? Um, I mean, if we lent into coal, if we increased coal production, then, you know, you don't need as much, don't need as much gas. Um, kind of like we saw in Europe over the yeah. past year or so. Oh, that's what's happened in Germany. Um, yeah. And that's what sort of New South Wales and Victoria are doing. Like they're extending the life of their coal-fired power stations because they can't, let them drop out of the grid yet because the lights will go out. I mean, if they had gas available, then they'd cut their emissions by 50% for the same amount of power, um, but they doesn't, don't seem interested in doing that. don't know why. But um, What's the sort of time period from putting the, the CapEx in to getting the, you know, with with coal you say you can just keep the thing going, you know, so it's it's pretty straightforward. With Is there a sort of time from when the CapEx would need to be spent for gas to see that return? Oh, it all depends on the project, but if you're if you're looking offshore – um, and even onshore, the, is it Nabari or Narrabri? Nar- 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 yeah. yeah, what's the? Like, I think that's been in limbo for over a decade. I want to say. Yeah, and yeah. it wouldn't take that long. It'd only take a couple of years to bring that. Yeah, I think, line, it, right? I think that'd be yeah. I'm yeah. sure. I reckon two years would probably be a route right. And as a result of not getting that project through, well, we have a greater reliance on coal, which we can all agree is a terrible outcome for the environment. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I don't, I don't understand it either. It's um, but you know, you can, every, you know, I think everybody goes, oh. You know, LED lights are better than halogen lights because they use eighty percent less electricity. But for some, and but their utility is 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 you know very um, very small because they can make stuff light and that's it. Whereas with gas, you can produce electricity, to use everything. It uses half or produces sorry half of the emissions of, of coal. But yet somehow that's not good enough um, in the in the mind, in the eyes of a lot of people. But whatever. Um, but uh, back to your to, to your point, I think onshore, you know, my, my sort of my feeling is about two years to, to ramp narrow right up, but I think they still need to get approval to run the pipeline into that that project, which, you know, requires all sorts of landowner approvals and whatnot and is difficult. But then um, offshore, I mean, you, I think you're probably looking at three, four years plus, and that's, that's after you found a deposit in the first place. Have you got any other sort of examples where you think across, you know, commodities across actually across all sort of sectors in the market where you think just there is far too much group think going on or there's an example where things have gotten out of proportion you've got a quite a strong contrarian view uh good question um yeah afterpay was one of them it's not in my sector but uh <laughs> geez that hurt us on hurt us on the way up even though it's probably not worth much today <laughs> oh, yeah i'll see i was no it wasn't afterpay what was the um no, it was square, wasn't it? The per- most perfectly timed sellout oh. in history. Like two, absolutely was it beautiful. T- two yeah. days later, they yeah. bloody it all just went to shit, and oh. then the value of the company that bought them was less than what they paid for our, um, well, Square. Yeah, well, they got <laughs> they got script. So the um, it's not it was like Square, the, wasn't it? It was square. square. They call themselves Block now, but yeah. the um, yeah, the Afterpay guys got paid script, which is <laughs> not worth heaps anymore. Yeah. <laughs> I think they sold a bit on the way up. They'll yeah. be all right. Yeah, they'll be right. <laughs> um, but, um, I, I was going to say a bit to contrary. I mean, in terms of the resource projects now, or the mining projects, I mean, I mean, some of these, you know, a lot of these conceptual lithium plays, I think, have, have rolled over. I think the interest rates going up is where these concept stocks really start to tr- struggle pretty quickly. So, I, I mean, there's not a, not one now, which I think is, um, is, uh, is massively overvalued and, and just sort of, you know, um, you know, had it sitting above a big, uh, a big downdraft, but um, yeah, certainly we've had some pretty big sell downs from some of these conceptual lithium stocks over the last, um, you know, a couple of months. And but you know, but whereas the real thing, the discoveries, whether the Azures and the Wildcats and stuff, which is you know, good old fashioned spodumene, um, produced by you know a known, um, a known rich market, um, have continued to do pretty well. I think a lot, of, a couple of the contrarian ones have played out already. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that were overvalued. Yeah, well, the, the contrarian... Recent, like, recent months. It's funny, you look at, like, Pilbara, right? 20% short interest. The contrarian view there is, like, long long. Pilbara. Is that what it is at you the moment? I mean? yeah. 20% Yeah, shorted. so the consensus is, like, oh. short, you know. Yeah. Um, anyway. Right, there we go, part one, boys. Sensational. Um, we could... Part two, so usually the logical path is part one's big and broad. Part two coming up, niche. We talk companies. Talk a lot. What do we talk? God, Genesis, Sora, Banda, Pilbara, like the lithium billionaires. Yeah. Uh, uranium. Uh, like a lot of uranium stocks. Paladin. Paladin and Sput. 
Yeah. Overrated, underrated. Oh, overrated, underrated. That's one a, sentence answers. Yeah, yeah, but bloody good sentences. So thanks again, Sammy. And uh, we'll drop that one tomorrow. And I would highly recommend bloody listening to it and uh, hope you enjoyed that one right uh, as always thanks to the partners let's rip through them DSI Underground Terra Capital McMahon Mining Title Services MMTS Future Proof Consulting Anytime Exploration Services KCA Site Services JP Search Brooks Airways and k thanks very much guys Hooteroo. appreciate it Hooteroo, Money Miners Hooteroo. Information contained in this episode of Money of Mine is of general nature only and does not take into account the objectives, financial situation or needs of any particular person. Before making any investment decision, you should consult with your financial advisor and consider how appropriate the advice is to your objectives, financial situation and needs.